What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, and this is the Wolf of All Streets podcast. I am more than excited for today's conversation, which has been long overdue. Raul Paul is an expert in everything finance, markets, crypto, and in captivating audience around the world. Years ago, Real Vision was just a seedling of an idea that Raul had, which he manifested into one of the greatest disruptive financial media brands of our time, helping to inform curious minds around the world. If you aren't already impressed with his video appearances, podcasting, and interviews, he's also a prolific writer and publisher for the Global Macro Investor, another company he founded. As long as there are markets, I have no doubt that Raul will be intelligently analyzing them for all of us. Raul Paul, man, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I didn't even pay you for that intro, but that's the best intro I've ever had. Okay, well, you can send a check anytime you're ready. Or, or just send me some Bitcoin, of course. So once again, before we get into the questions, you're listening to the Wolf of All Streets podcast, where twice a week I talk to your favorite personalities in the worlds of Bitcoin, finance, trading, art, music, sports, even politics. This podcast is powered by Blockworks, the fastest growing media company in the digital asset space. You can visit blockworks.co for access to the highest quality information in the space. I promise you won't be disappointed. And of course, if you listen to this podcast, which you are right now, and you follow me on Twitter, you should check out everything else I got going on at thewolfofallstreets.io. Now to get in today's episode. So whenever I picture you, and you're not there right now, but I can't help but visually uh, visualize you with that signature background, the huge bar behind your video. So I'm wondering uh, what the, the house specials are that you offer there. My, my signature cocktail is the Hemingway Daiquiri, which is right. white rum, uh, squeezed fresh grapefruit juice, a little bit of um, triple sec or Cointreau in it, shaken over ice. Um, that's, that's a great great Caribbean drink. Man, that thing sounds amazing. And it makes me just jealous. Every time I see you there in the Caribbean, I just literally want to pack up everything and move. But then uh, my wife and kids probably wouldn't like that very much. So <laughs> to, get, to, to, to get deeper into it, you famously coined the phrase irresponsibly long Bitcoin, which we all love and use when price was much, much lower than it is now. Has anything changed with regards to your view or, or conviction? No, I mean, my conviction is like happens to all of us. It just keeps growing. And and it's not really just a function of price. It's a function of the amount of people that come into the space, the thoughts that's going on, the development going on. So yeah, I'm still both irresponsibly long financially, I've, I've not sold a single thing, and I'm irresponsibly long in terms of commitment to where this is all going. So uh, obviously there's the trickle down effect from Bitcoin into Ethereum, into all coins. And you have uh, had no qualms with saying that you're interested in Ethereum as well. Is that also still the case? Yes. I mean, there is a, I've spent a long time trying to say to people, just because people got burnt in 2017 doesn't mean everything repeats. I mean, in the end, Ethereum survived all of that, as did several other projects. And it's a risk curve. We're just starting a whole space and a risk curve in financial markets, you know, a bond investor might go to corporate credit and then go to junk bonds. Or an equity guy might go to, you know, um, blue chips, to tech stocks, to emerging markets. It's normal. It's risk-adjusted returns. And when you go further out, in, in this case, it's the altcoin space, of course they're riskier. So, of course, you take less risk, unless you really know what you're doing and you want to commit to that. But for generally speaking... You take much less risk, and the idea is you get compensated by the returns, but you may not get because it's risky. I mean, the word risk is a real word. It's not a one-way bet. <laughs> and how deep down that rabbit hole do you foresee yourself going beyond the you know top 10 market cap? <laughs> and, or Yeah, I mean, at this stage, I don't have the bandwidth. It's this way too much to learn. Um, and I don't have the, the ability to understand. I'm a macro guy. I'm not a stock picker. So therefore, I'm not a token picker either. Some people do exceptionally well doing that. You know, we're seeing that with people like you know, Jeff Dorman at Arca and, you know, the guys at um, Delphi and stuff like that. Those guys figure out the ins and outs of every single token. I'm just not that guy. So really, for me, it's the top down. Where is this space going? Where are the opportunities? Can I broad broadly represent that view? Now, I actually read that you started uh, by training people in technical analysis, which I found really, really interesting because there's always the debate as to you know whether technical analysis is a useful tool. I obviously believe so for, for various reasons, but I'm curious, uh, where did you learn technical analysis? How passionate were you about it? And still, is it still something that you view as a useful tool? So uh, I got my first job out of university was a graduate trainee at a company called 
uh, Dow Jones Tellerate, which was the Bloomberg of the time. Um, and I was supporting the technical analysis product. I didn't know what technical analysis was during my economics degree at university. I think it was a half hour lecture, which is like charts don't really work, you know, but some people use these. So I had no idea. Um, but then they gave me this huge book, which was John Murphy's Guide to Technical Analysis of the Futures Markets, which it was what it's now called Financial Markets. Um, and I had to read it. And then I had to learn how to show people around this product called Teletrack, which was the charting product. I had no idea. And the first people I ended up interacting with was all of the famous prop guys from Goldman who ended up form, uh, forming the Tudor office in London when they all left in the early 90s. And you know, I had to teach them a lot of it. Um, and then from then on, I just taught myself and realized that I was a very visual person. So it actually just helped me. Because I could say, somebody can say to me, what do you think about German buns? I'm, I've no idea. Put the chart up, I've got an opinion some sort of opinion, something more informed without knowing all of the fundamental analysis. It's very helpful. And then I learned over my career that all the macro guys, because we have to look at so much stuff across so many different parts of the ecosystem, that charts is where everybody starts. You know, you start looking for the interesting charts and thinking, huh, now all charts are really, it's not voodoo, it's just human behavior. It's just human behavior. Because basically, if you go into a cinema, a crowded cinema and shout fire, eight times out of 10, people will do the same thing. So it's, it's probabilistic outcomes based on human behavior. And you can also see where it's come from. Were people panicky? Were people overconfident? You know, it's not that complicated. But again, you know, people don't like it because people want to treat everything as a science. And life is not a science, it's an art. I absolutely uh, agree that I view technical analysis as an art or a pseudoscience, I guess, if you want to be, but it's literally so supply and demand, support, resistance, all of these lines exist solely because it's where people place their orders based on their lack of emotional control. Right? Well, I, you know, one of the great learnings for me was I remember back in 2000, Microsoft was breaking its... 50 week moving average. And I'm, I'm like, I didn't really care about moving averages. But what I realized at the time, everybody was dollar cost averaging into stuff. And basically what it meant is everybody looked back at their PL and realized over the last year they'd lost money. That's what happens when you break the 52 week moving average is everybody's lost money for a year. And that happened to be a psychological point where everyone's like, oh, fuck this, I'm out of this. Right. And they sell their Microsoft shares. And then you're like, yeah, I get it. You know, humans are humans. We're all idiots. We do the same thing. Yeah, it makes absolute, absolute sense. So I want to talk a bit about uh, stimulus because obviously we just saw 1.9 trillion in, in stimulus. Now they're proposing in the United States a 3 trillion infrastructure and an announcement that in April we will get yet again more stimulus. So I'm curious how that's sustainable and, and what your thoughts are on that plan. It's absolutely sustainable for the government to do it and the central bank to keep financing it by the way that they look at the world. So they will keep doing this. This will not stop because, you know, let's face it, I don't know what I would do being a central banker or a government official right now. True. You've got an economy that's totally broken. You know, the stock market, we'll come onto that in a bit, doesn't really re represent what's going on on Main Street. So businesses are destroyed. You know, if you go to the US, infrastructure is like third world. It needs to be upgraded. You need to create new jobs. If you look at the trend rate of GDP over the last 30 years, it's been falling because of demographics and debt and all. Somebody has to change that cycle, right? So are you going to just throw out the rule book, go for MMT? I get it. What else are you going to do? Austerity? Forget it. Yeah. So you're going to do something. So that is going to happen. And everyone's going to go inflation. CPI is going to go up and it's not. And the central banks are going to declare victory. And meanwhile, suddenly you'll look around and the stock market's gone up another 100%. And the price of some of the commodities have, and the price of artwork, and the price of anything with a fixed supply asset. And then you'll realize that what they're actually doing is debasing the currency. Of the course. dollar won't fall because everybody's doing it. It's the value of fiat currency overall. This is what people don't get their heads around. They keep saying, the dollar's going to zero. No, no, no. Can't. The Europeans are doing the same. The Japanese are doing the same. 
the Brits are doing the same, the Aussies are doing, it's a massive devaluation of fiat currency overall. Which is interesting because at this very moment, we're seeing what some are calling a reversal or at least a, a bounce in the dollar. And it's showing quite a bit of strength over the past few months, actually, if you look at it now, which like you said, it seems counterintuitive to anyone goes, well, print, 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 print. How does the value go up? I mean, what do you make of this dollar bounce that we're seeing at the moment? I mean, I've been fully expecting it. The US is the best performing market in the world. Um, the technological rate of change in the US is probably faster than elsewhere right now. I mean, China's, you know, Asia's doing pretty well, but it's sucking in the world's capital. Also, everybody's short dollars from debts. I mean, there's 13 to 15 trillion dollars that people are short. So if you've got a cash flow squeeze going on anywhere in the world, they're scrambling to buy dollars. You know, we've already seen that in Brazil because the virus has come back to Brazil with a vengeance. The Brazilian real is now falling every day. You know, the dollar, it's very hard for the dollar to go down because of this dynamic. It's 88% of world trade. Everything right. is priced in dollars. Right. So it's really, it's really a measure of relative strength, not strength itself, right? <laughs> as long as you're doing better than everyone else, it will continue to rise, even if you continue to print and you continue to inflate. Or the world goes to shit as well. And then people go to dollars because it's safety. So it's called the dollar smile. When things go well, people go to dollars. When things go badly, they go to dollars. When the world is kind of muddling through with, you know, the US growing at one and a half percent, the money tends to flow out of dollars and goes out the risk curve and goes out to emerging markets and other places. So, you know, it's so if you're a government or a central bank and you're debasing your currency, for what it appears to them is there's no real consequence, right? Because the dollar hasn't got trashed, rates don't go up, CPI hasn't gone up. So, where's the payback? Now, the payback is for you and I because we can buy less housing with our income or less of a share of the S&P or a company or whatever it is, less of a share of the fixed assets. And this exacerbates the 1% versus the 99 because the 1% can afford to buy assets and they go up and they compensate for the debasement of currency. But your income doesn't go up. So people who just live off income can't invest. They get proportionally less investing. So to give it a comparison, a baby boomer who was 32 years old in 1980 could buy something like 60% more property, 60% more S&P, 60% more gold than a 32-year-old millennial now with the same inflation-adjusted income. So it's, it's, the, it's the investment assets that have gone up, which is why the rich get richer and not the income. I mean, I've always said that millennials really got the short end of the stick. They get a bad rap, obviously, because it's the generation I've moved back in with my parents. But the truth is, I mean, they never really had a chance from that perspective. No, because if, if you think about them as 30-year-olds, so they're starting to come into peak earnings now, or you know, you know, proper significant earnings, equity market all-time record high valuations, fixed income market all-time record low yields, credit markets all-time record low yields, property prices all-time record highs the exact inverse of their parents who were the boomers, the exact inverse. The boomers basically didn't have to do anything to make money. They just had to put it anywhere. So, and then the third part of this is they ended up in debt as soon as they were, by 30 years old, they all had like 50 grand's worth of debt or 80 grand's or 100 grand's worth of debt from university. Their parents never had that. So they had everything going against them until crypto came along, which, was the, which is you know, one of the great opportunities. And there's a bunch of other stuff going on in the background as well that I think is going to change this whole dynamic. All right. Can you talk about those other things? I mean, everybody, obviously, we, we talk about crypto ad nauseum on this show, on Twitter, and everywhere else we can uh, find an unfortunate human who will listen to us. Um, but, you know, what, what are those other things? So I spent a long time thinking about what is going on and seeing the markets go up so fast in the middle of still what the largest recession of our lifetimes and basically of the last 100 years. And I realized that if you divided the S&P or any of these by the Fed balance sheet, they'd gone nowhere. So they were just offsetting the debasement. So I'd started looking through all markets, thinking, okay, what's offsetting and what's not? And what's interesting is, is the S&P was basically just about offsetting it. Gold was doing okay, but not great. Real estate was about the same. They were all kind of trading in a range with each other. 
which showed you this denominator effect that I'm talking about was happening, except two things, the NASDAQ and crypto. Let's forget crypto, the NASDAQ, why? And the, the classic Twitter refrain is old man shouting at the internet, it's a bubble. <laughs> but when you look at it, this technology that is going on is facing network effects, Metcalfe's law. These are not like bringing out a new product, you know, a, a better mouse or whatever, right? This is a, these are things, new things that create adoption effects. Adoption effects, network effects, Metcalfe's law don't price in P ratio terms. That's why nobody owned Amazon all the way up, particularly cynical people, macro people, you know, gold bugs. It's like, I can't own this. It's, you know, it's, right. it's a and why, of and why test and, and why Tesla at its valuation was still rising. Correct. And nobody got it and they still don't get it. But those fang stocks have outperformed and we all got it wrong. To be honest, we all got it wrong. Um, and because we didn't understand. But the more we got into crypto, the more we started to understand network effects and realizing that it applies. Okay, so what is coming down the pike is something so extraordinary that I've just changed my entire macro framework based on it. Wow. Is thinking about this, thinking about, okay, what is the true denominator and realizing, okay, technology is outperforming crypto. And then you start thinking, right, we've just developed a MNR. I can't even pronounce it ever. The vaccine that has come in basically in two months, groundbreaking, 20 years of work, but they basically cleared it through. Now that may clear malaria and a whole bunch of others. People are working on cancer stuff using the same technology. Biotech is going to have money thrown at it. That's one. The other one is I was walking, I was writing a piece about carbon offsets in Europe, which is a fantastic trade. And I, Writing that piece, I realized that the EU is basically going to reduce all its carbon emissions 65% in the next nine years, right? And it, it's going to drive a massive green revolution. And it's happening everywhere. It's not just the EU. And before it used to be, oh, it's 20 years ahead. It's now happening. Every car outside my window here in the Cayman Islands, in 10 years' time, it's going to be obsolete. Sure. So yeah. think of the number of cars that have to be sold, electric cars. Think of the technology that goes with electric cars, things like edge computing, localized networks. What does 5G fit into this? 5G is being rolled out around the world so everybody has access to super data. Now, anywhere that doesn't have 5G is getting Starlink and the other ones that, you know, Elon Musk Starlink, right? So basically you're about to connect the entire planet with free data in the next five years, everybody. You're then going to give them the whole crypto world, the digital banking, digital money, stores of value, all of that. You're going to then be able to distribute computing power across massive networks, distributed computing like we do with cl cloud. That increases the computing power for science. And I mean, it goes on and on and on. We've got autonomous driving, autonomous cars. I mean, that's coming in the next five years. I think mm -hmm. somebody between Tesla or Google is going to get that across the line. Sure, it'll be for Amazon delivery vehicles first or whatever. So we've got a ton of these technologies. And I've only listed some of them that are all coming out in the next five years. They're all... None of these are ideas now, they're all products. They're all happening. The internet of things, all of this is happening. So we're going to go probably through the largest change in human history of technology in the shortest period of time. And everything has network effects. None of these are new products. These are new ways of how we create productivity. We've also got the metaverse, the digital world. I think the metaverse yeah. itself can double the size of global GDP. Because it's like discovering the Americas again. It's a whole new world where you can earn money, own real estate, do investing, create businesses, live essentially. Okay, so you've doubled the size of the world. People don't get their heads around the size of what is happening. And, you know, and crypto is part of that picture and it's all happening right now. So I've now thought that 
the advantage the millennials have is they understand this. They're not cynical macro people who think the world is mean reverting. They kind of understand adoption effects. Um, and if they can, they can invest around it. This is why I wrote that tweet about Kathy Wood. People don't understand. She's got every one of these things. She's, so, oh my God, she's she got is. every one of these themes and the old men railing at the internet are going, it's a bubble, they're illiquid stocks. I don't care. Crypto's a liquid. What you've got here is she's chosen pretty much every right theme that is going to be truly transformational, not in 20 years, time, not in 10 years, time, now for the next five years. So the probability of her hitting some, home, sure, some of these won't work, but her hitting a home run here is enormous. And nobody can see it because everybody's too cynical because they believe in a mean reverting world. And we don't live in a mean reverting world any longer. We live in the exponential age. Yeah, I mean, and to some degree, those tech stocks were what have, you know, carried everything along, dragged along the rest of the stock market on the way up during this entire correction. And they are arguably as good of inflation hedges so, as Bitcoin. And yes, they are. Well, uh, Bitcoin's outperformed them, but still, they're very good. They've outperformed the balance sheet and all of that. So the easiest way to check, to head check, is this a network adoption style story or not? Is just simply log, do a log chart. So as we do in crypto, right? We're so used to it, but we don't think of it in stock market terms because we're used to mean reverting. But if you just put a chart of Amazon on a log chart or Facebook, they're perfect. They're just perfect network adoption models. They're exactly the same as Bitcoin, exactly the same as Ethereum. They're all the same thing, which is they're just network models. It's brilliant. What's up, guys? If you've been following me literally for more than five minutes and you don't live under a rock, then you've probably heard me talk about Voyager, which is where I invest and trade Bitcoin and other assets. I love this platform so much. I literally can't stop talking about it. Now, it's so easy to just go download the app, start an account, attach your bank account, and start trading 55 assets completely commission-free. I've saved so much money on fees. It's a complete joke. And the best part of the whole thing and why, honestly, I prefer them to everyone else is because while you're trading or holding, you can earn an insane amount of interest up to 10% on USDC, 7.25% on Bitcoin, and 6.25% on Ethereum, and a number of other assets, actually. And all of this is with no lockups or limits. You should absolutely try Voyager. Go to investvoyager.com, or you can search for Voyager on the Apple App Store or Google Play Store and get $25 in free Bitcoin when you use my promo code SCOTT25. What are you waiting for? Go. This episode is brought to you by Mina, the world's lightest blockchain powered by participants. Mina uses ZK Snarks to keep the blockchain a fixed size of 22 kilobytes. Bitcoin's ledger is currently 336 gigabytes and growing. That means you can fit 45,000 Mina blockchain proofs in the same storage place. 22 kilobytes is the equivalent of the email you sent your ex asking for your high school sweatshirt back. 22 kilobytes is the equivalent of eight tweets you sent about shrimp tails in your cereal. 22 kilobytes is so small, if it were a ship, it'd fit through the Suez Canal while the Evergreen was still stuck there. This means any website, program, or startup can use their blockchain to protect and verify data without the need to run a massive node. The ecosystem is growing so fast, and Mina's mainnet has just gone live, offering users a platform to build a private gateway between the real world and crypto. And a reminder that Mina's public token sale, only available to non-US persons, will take place on April 13th with their official partner, Coinless. Go to minaprotocol.com slash wolf to find out more. DeFi is where all the excitement is, but participating in it can be a nightmare. Not anymore with Matcha. Matcha makes it ridiculously easy to create a wallet, onboard new users, execute trades, and source liquidity. The best part is that it's cheaper than Uniswap and delivers the best prices on the market by aggregating all the available liquidity and routing to the best source. My favorite part of Matcha is that it offers high-level trading features like limit orders, liquidity depth visualization, gas efficiency, and more. Sign up for Matcha now at matcha.xyz slash wolf. That's M-A-T-C-H-A dot X-Y-Z slash W-O-L-F. And join the tens of thousands of traders who are already a part of the movement. It's funny you talk about uh, the cars outside your window. I have a six-year-old daughter and I'm a huge Tesla fan. And she asked me the other day, she's like, well, when am I going to learn to drive, dad? And I said, never. You're not going to drive. Your, your driver's license is 10 years away. Everybody will be in, uh, just like you said. I mean, every car will be driving itself. She'll probably never drive a car. 
right? Yeah. That, I mean, the, the, the notion seems absurd, but I, I think that that'll and be the case even never, for 10 year olds. And she may never work in the physical world. She may yeah. work in a virtual, she may never attend a physical university. I mean, th th this is the magnitude of what is happening here. These are not kind of science fiction stories. I mean, there was an amazing story of, you know, during lockdown, one of these um, school teachers or university lecturers, I'm not sure what it was, decided to hold his lectures in one of the metaverses and got the kids to go to attend there. And it, he found that it was very natural for them to do it. So, and then they were interacting with each other because they could see each other's avatars and there's Joey there and there's, you know, Tina over there. They all chat to each other. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I mean, everything has changed. Yeah, which is why even though, you know, NFTs, I could, it could be argued to be in a bubble as far as price and the, the art side and some of the use cases when you really dig into what the future is, I, I, I don't see how the NFT space does not continue to grow and absolutely explode. And not because of the art, but because you consider it as the currency of these metaverses that you talk about, because you, you know, you eliminate the middleman and there's no toll collector in the middle of these direct transactions with NFTs. It's just an authenticated scarce asset. That's all it is. Right. That, it's like having a painting um, authenticated by Christie's. Oh, yes, that's an original Michelangelo, right? Those words are worth Four hundred million dollars. Yeah, right. It's an original Banksy. Okay, that's worth fifty million bucks. That's all it is, and then we can transfer it with the trusted ownership. Great, and you know what? It might have some rights with it as well, which is really interesting. We haven't even started where this is all going with NFTs, and you know, I'm I've also been thinking about the bubble narrative. Right, this is a narrative about two thousand. Well, look at two thousand. That was a terrible bubble, was it? Yes. What? If you look at the chart now, it's, it's a blip. meaningless. It's meaningless. What it was was just an S curve adoption, uh, S curve phase of the early stage of what we're seeing now, which was Amazon, and that fell ninety percent. Then now look at it. Should you have sold yeah. it? Was it a bubble, or was it just part of the network effects? And I, you know, I'm starting to see the world differently. And I, it sounds like crazy, bullish, and utopian, but I think we've all been wrong. Well, I think what people see as bubbles are often are just a purge of the things that didn't work. No, right? I mean, if you're going to have innovation, you need to have thousands of people throwing darts and taking shots on things that seem absolutely insane. And it's totally fine if only five of them succeed. Of course it is. What are bubbles and what people misunderstand is things like commodities. Because commodities, the more they go up in price, the more they create more supply and the more they lower their own demand and then they collapse, right? So they're mean reverting. In fact, many things are mean reverting where you're not seeing network effects, i.e. you're not seeing mass adoption. So when there was the short squeeze in Volkswagen back in 2008, it was just a short squeeze. It was a bubble and then it collapsed. But it's not to do with that. That was not to do with anything to do with the business model or the adoption of it. It was just a technical situation, as was silver. And that happens periodically in various things. And they're mean reverting those kinds of assets. I mean, if there was a... If... General Electric didn't change its business model at all, and it went up 300% from here, it's probably likely to mean revert, unless they've changed their business model, which they may well do. Um, but, you know, it's just, we need to get our heads around the different types of businesses. That makes total sense. So I want to go back to something you talked about with obviously the dollar sort of being the denominator for how we view all of these other things. We've always seen an inverse correlation between the dollar to some degree between yeah, metals. Yeah, it's the kind of dollar, but the fiat dollar as opposed to the relative dollar, Correct. right? Right, right. Because you're looking Correct. at Amazon in dollars versus Amazon in Fed balance sheet. They're two different things. Right. That absolutely makes sense. My, 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 my question was, obviously, you generally see an inverse correlation. Dollar weakness, you see stocks go up, you see metals go up, you see all this. Well, that was somewhat true with Bitcoin historically. But again, now that we've seen the dollar bouncing this time, we've seen Bitcoin raging next to it. What do you make of the fact that we're finally seeing, you know, uh, uh, really both of them rising at the same time? Um, again, we talked about the, the dollar is a very different beast and nobody really knows what drives it. It's, it has what's known as a Bayesian distribution, which means that there's multi-factor kind of variables that affect it at various times. It could be current account deficits, it could be flows, it could be M&A, it could be 
interest rate differentials. So it's really hard to forecast currencies. In fact, the best forecasting of currencies is done by technical analysis um, because nobody knows how to model them. They're really right. complicated things. Um, so there is times when crypto is correlated and times where it's not. Now, sure, if we have a massive risk off, let's say the dollar DXY goes to 105 in the next month. Well, the chances are crypto is going to sell off because everyone's going to freak out. Last now, March. Is that yeah. a correlation? No. That's a passing correlation be built on risk. There is a risk correlation between all assets because in the end, if, if, you, if you're going to liquidate some stuff, you're going to liquidate some stuff, whatever it is. So, but the overall correlation, that's the great thing, is Bitcoin is not correlated. Oh my God, thank you. I, I had this conversation with Mark Yusko and we were both sort of like screaming from the top of the hills and just every time we mention it, somebody jumps in and shows you this very short-term cor correlation. They say, look at March 12th, right? It's, and, and, and don't understand that no. of course there's going to be moments, but largely it's a, it's a random walk. And you can even, I mean, if you're a Markowitz fan or whatever, you can even dig in and say, listen, like mathematically, these are near a zero. You know, they've never gotten to one. They're, they're not correlated assets by any stretch, especially if you stretch the time frame. It just infuriates me, the correlation argument. What they're all correlated to is something called a VAR shock. So that's the value at risk. When volatility climbs in your portfolio, you have to take less risk because if not, your risk of blowing up goes up. So what happens is people reduce risk. We've just seen that with the guy. Um, oh my God, Wayne, yeah, uh, the I, Arca something uh, capital, yeah, whatever, but yeah, the, obviously whatever the, 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 uh, family the, huge block, right? the huge block trading from so, Goldman so and Morgan last week. what happened with him was that he yeah. had a VAR shock. 100 billion himself. bucks. Yeah, he had a VAR shock himself, right? So he has to liquidate everything and that created a VAR shock with other people as well. And so people just liquidate anything to pay the bills. And that happens periodically. That is not to do with the fact that the stock market went down. It's, it's think of it as a separate thing is if risk blows up, then everything has a wobble for a period of time. And that's okay. And usually what happens is the things that are stronger, that have better stories behind them, better fundamentals come out of that VAR shop much quicker. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes perfect sense. And Bitcoin is exceptionally liquid. <laughs> I mean, if you need to get out of Bitcoin, you can get out of Bitcoin. In March, you couldn't sell a bond if your life depended on it at that moment. No, people don't understand the magnitude of March. Right? The entire world stopped. Never happened before. Never. The entire world stopped. As you said, the most liquid markets on, on earth, the currency markets and the bond markets, basically were untradeable. Because everybody was at home. There was no risk management, nobody was in the office, there was nothing, there was no trade going on. Nothing, the world had stopped. So that is the most extreme situation of all time. <laughs> so if we're trying Literally. to correlate Bitcoin to that, this is madness, right? This is... And, and honestly, it's almost mind-blowing to think that that was only a year ago when you describe it as one of the biggest global economic events in history, if not the biggest, to see where we are now. But again, it feels weird to say and see where we are now when we know that really, those of us in financial markets, we see markets going up, blah, blah, blah. But when you speak to a friend who's got a, you know, a service business, a restaurant, a bar, hairdressing salon, they're totally screwed. Yeah. But, I mean, people don't understand. And I think the Fed is right in their focus on unemployment. People are like, yeah, but the market's at all-time highs. Why are you stimulating? They don't understand that people in retail are never going to get a job again. Ever. I saw this in, when I was a young kid, 70, 90, the UK in 1979, 1981, 82, we lost the shipbuilding industry, the car industry, the ship, steel industry, and the coal industry all at the same time. Every single one of those industries was destroyed. None of those people ever got jobs. Well, none of them. Call it 40% got jobs again. 60% were structurally unemployed until they retired. Okay, so then what happens now? If, if that's the case, you can't just uh, use stimulus, obviously, to keep them afloat, especially knowing that the price of goods is going to rise. So you, you well, presented the sort of- isn't. The price of goods is not going up. Excuse me, relative, the, the power of the dollar will be devalued and you will not be able to buy as much of the same price goods with your money. But um, either way, their buying power will decrease. Um, 
Well, I don't know, because the buying power of, again, it depends what it is. I mean, food inflation is all passing. This is not correlated to Fed balance sheets or anything else. The deflationary impact of technology on food, finished goods is enormous. It's on assets that the real issue is. Right. But these people, I, yeah, I, the answer is, is I don't know. And this is why universal basic income comes up, because basically what we've actually done is technology has replaced the jobs. And sure, COVID accelerated it. And it's inherently deflationary, of course. I mean, prices should and, come down. And, yeah. And so if you are in government and you're going to say, OK, if we're going to have to support all these people because technology destroyed them all in one go, as opposed to over time, can we get the technology companies to pay more tax so we can implement universal basic income? It's a pretty compelling argument because most of them pay no tax. Um, and, you know, it's not fair because it's hard for individuals to pay no tax, um, but it's easy for a company to pay no tax, especially giant companies. So it's pretty easy to get through politically. Right. Yeah. That, that. <laughs> Nobody's going to be mad if they see the uh, corporations taxed more heavily. The, the citizens. Except the rich investors have managed right. to own Amazon shares. Right. But nobody else cares if Amazon actually pays 25 percent taxes. Uh, absolutely. So you, you've reported recently. Um, obviously that you're seeing interest from sovereign wealth funds in crypto. I know that there was a fund in Singapore. Do you think that we're just at the tip of the iceberg with adoption from sovereign wealth? Do you think that we're going to see a lot more of those announcements in, in the coming future? Yes. And because Bitcoin, as soon as they understand that Bitcoin is a very, very long duration asset, it perfectly suits protecting the wealth of nations. That's all the sovereign wealth funds are, right? Usually it's an oil or commodity producing country that gets windfalls in boom times and has hard times and they offset it by drawing down on this pool, right? It's a savings pool. Now that savings pool needs to grow over time. A lot of it's denominated in US dollars because everything's in dollars. So they try and diversify, but to have assets that offset global inflation or, or global debasement of currency, et cetera, it's a perfect asset, particularly because it's so skewed to the upside that they can have a 3% allocation. They can lose half of it and it makes no difference. But if you get it right, it really does make a difference to the portfolio. So I, I think it's very well suited. The problem is, as I've argued all along, is they can't really come in until it goes up more in market cap. Right, just not big enough. Just not big enough yet. Because so these what, guys are, you know, Norway, I don't know, it's a trillion dollars, you know, I mean, these guys are huge, huge. And they, you know, they're, they're not like BlackRock, which is, you know, a few trillion dollars, but they've got millions of different funds. These guys are basically one gigantic asset allocation. It's, uh, you know, so, you know, a ticket for them, you know, they even allocate hedge fund ticket sizes of like a billion dollars or, you know, half a billion dollars. So let alone doing something like this, so they, you know, they need to put, 10, 20, 30 billion dollars at work just to have a minor allocation. It's huge. I've made the same argument for the larger corporations. You love, uh, you know, obviously crypto, crypto Twitter uh, gets deep in the argument of when Google, when Facebook, when Apple, all of these. I mean, it's just, it's always been my argument that it's really just not big enough yet. It's no. getting there now. I was really making that argument when we heard 10, 20,000. So maybe now you can get 1% in, but I mean, what is the market cap level when this becomes really, really interesting to the huge money? I think 10 trillion, you know, I think something like that makes sense. Um, or bigger. I yeah. think also it is interesting. I think Michael Saylor has been talking about this, but I don't think he's explained it super well. He's talked about the cost of capital um, being 15% and therefore all of these corporate treasuries invest in bonds. What he's actually talking about is if you take the, the printing of the balance sheets by the G4 central banks, and you annualize it, it's growing at about 15% a year, which is that denominator falling by 15% a year. So you do buy bonds. So now let's say you are Microsoft. Okay, you've got this gigantic corporate treasury, several hundred billion dollars in it, and you've got a bunch of credit and a bunch of you know normal stuff. Now, all of that is underperforming the Fed balance sheet. Now, does it really matter because wages are also underperforming everything else? It underperforms because people like Microsoft do two things also, by companies and by real estate. 
both of those are priced in Fed balance sheet terms. They keep going up because they're fixed assets. Um, so they haven't got their heads around this yet. I think people haven't really explained it to them that sure, your, your cash flow and the corporate credit that you own will carry on for your needs for you know salaries or whatever else it is, general organic growth. But if you want to buy things, they're more expensive. So yeah. I yeah, found it very interesting. Point. Obviously, speaking of Michael Saylor, you know, first, I don't think that anybody else is going to do quite what MicroStrategy did. Right. I think we'll see more of the approach where a company invests one to 5%, not goes uh, all in on that level, but I love it. Um, he just hosted, uh, now it's been months, you know, uh, some say 2,000 corporations teaching them how to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And we haven't really seen any announcements. I was expecting that uh, we would sort of see a flood, but do you think that that's something that's still coming and it just, they haven't reported yet or? Um... Again, this space makes me laugh because this space has all come from retail investors who really don't know how the institutional world uh, The works. due diligence, I mean, is, yeah. I just, you know, I've been helping tons of people trying to get across the line and the amount of meetings and the risk meetings and the meetings with the with the prime brokering or the custodians and then the reports that need to be written. It's endless. It's endless. So, you know, and particularly if you're a public company, you need you've got further things that you need to do. If you're a pension fund, you've well, got pensions, I'll do it for three years. I mean, <laughs> that's right. So, yeah. so, yes, of course, it's all coming. Uh, and it just takes time. And most of them won't announce it until it's in their filings. So that's right. the end of each quarter. quarter. So we'll get a bunch we'll hear about next time. We'll all go, oh my God, so-and-so's bought Bitcoin. Then we'll do it in another quarter. It's just, it's ongoing, right? Yeah, and it's going to continue. We're just going to keep seeing it. So speaking of, uh, you know, pensions and endowments being this huge flood, uh, wall of money, obviously, what is it going to take to get them in? Is the answer an ETF? Is it $10 trillion market cap? You know, do you think that that's something that we can see in the near future? Um, I think it's, you know, I've talked a lot about the pension crisis, you know, they're underfunded. And they took a lot of risk with people's money um, and put it all into equities. Now, it's still not enough to re for people to retire. So we've got a huge problem. Can Bitcoin help plug that gap? Yes. Um, but they're structurally got a real issue because you've got this millennial cohort that needs to buy a lot of stuff. And that's fine. And that's piling through in the passive investment vehicles and stuff like that. And then you've got this 76 million Americans who are trying to retire and can't. Uh, it's a bit of a messy situation. I do expect pensioners, pension funds to come into the space um, because they need to, the long duration asset works well for the millennial. I'm not, it could save the boomers, but there's a lot of risk to do it. So I don't know. 10 trillion market cap. I mean, they can't not, right? But there again, right. don't forget everyone, everyone, you know, again, the space is, makes me laugh because everyone's like, oh my God, but, but gold's a 10 trillion market cap. Yeah, find me a pension fund that invests in gold. Yeah. It's like about 3% of them, nobody cares. So it's not really an asset people think about. So it's really funny, this gold versus Bitcoin thing, because actually, and Dan Tapiero talks about this a lot, nobody's in gold anyway. Um, you know, it's basically family offices and retail and, and central banks that own gold, but not pension funds. Some endowments do, but not really. So when do central banks own Bitcoin? I think it's going to come from a small nation, you know, somebody like Costa Rica or somebody like that. Somebody who's had currency problems in the past and they've got a progressive young leader who says, let's just own some of this. So it's coming. Does it come on this cycle or the next cycle? My guess is actually this cycle. There'll be somebody small and everyone will laugh at them and say it's ridiculous, um, you know, as is the way, right? Yeah, I wonder if, I mean, there's, uh, it's not like there's any mystery around Iran and North Korea's interest in, in Bitcoin. It's, I, I would imagine that there are nations, as you spoke with Sovereign Wealth, who are heavily invested in Bitcoin one way or another already. Just maybe not the ones we would hear about. Yeah. Now, you know, why are North Korea and um, Iran interested? Very simply, Iran has cheap energy and it's a commodity for them to manufacture and sell that has a global market that doesn't require supply linkages, which the Americans choke. So why would they not do it? Well, you know, it's, it's, you know, they have a strategic advantage in doing it. 
But people are like, oh God, this is, you know, geopolitics at play. No, it's just countries who have an advantage in a commodity making that commodity. And if they get- Who are, san by who are sanctioned from other commodities. Yeah, right. it's, ridic right. it's ridiculous. It's not some geopolitical play to own Bitcoin. It's a play to make some money because we choked them. Venezuela is the same. And that's interesting. Why do we see so many of these narratives around Bitcoin it's for criminals? I mean, you know, ransomware is the next great attack, Bitcoin ransomware attacks, and it's only for drug dealers, and it's only for North Korea and Iran. I People, mean, I'm, I've learned this, and you'll see it with, with the response to that Kathy Wood tweet or any of this stuff that I've been talking about. People fear change. We live in a world of the politics of nostalgia where we look back on the 1950s, the baby boomers do, and thinking life was so simple. That world was never a good world either, but we have that politics of nostalgia because we fear change. And we're in a accelerating period of change right now. It's hard for people to understand, like you said, you can't understand the life that your daughter's gonna be living in 30 years time. You have literally no comprehension of what that might be. Um, so, you know, that's hard for all of us to get our heads around because we think it's wrong. I never forget when I first went to my oldest friend, I've known him since I was six. I went around to his house and his son was like 14 and he was, it was a Saturday and he was in a gaming chair, gaming. I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? He's like, well, he's been out playing football with his mates and stuff, but he's now socializing. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because we used to go to the shopping mall and meet our friends and figure out what's going on that evening, who's having a party. They do it all online. He goes, he's got his friend in the US. He was based in the UK. He's got his friend in the US, a friend in Spain, a bunch of his neighbors, all hanging out in Minecraft, whichever game he was playing, Fortnite, chatting. And I'm like, okay, the world has so much changed that I, I you know, and that's okay. I don't have to say that's wrong. It's terrible. It's how it changes. Hey, you kids, get off my lawn. You know, the old, the old, uh, the old yeah, man exactly. who kicked the ball under his lawn. Yeah, I mean, they're all hanging out on Discord servers and making uh, genuine friendships. You know, uh, there's nothing to, I, I, I just, I it mean, is incredibly interesting. I'm, I mean, Scott, look, at, look, you and I are chatting now very naturally over Zoom, right? This was relatively new for us 18 months ago. Yes, we all Absolutely. use video calls, but we barely use them. Now, I don't think of it differently than sitting having a coffee with you chatting. Sure. It's like, I mean, it's pretty natural now. Um, that's how fast we can change. But if you tell people, well, we're only going to speak to each other on video calls and people are going to know what about human interaction? This is human interaction. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting if you're in the crypto space and have been in it for a while, I think everyone finds it. Some of the people they would probably count as their best friends. They've probably never met in person. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. right. And what a paradigm shift that is. So yeah. I, I'm very curious as to your uh, thoughts on central bank digital currencies. We obviously saw recently that uh, MIT and the Boston Fed, uh, you know, will be coming out with prototypes soon. We know obviously what's happening in China. What do you think that uh, the effects of central bank digital currencies will be on uh, money structurally, but also, you know, more specifically on Bitcoin? I, again, we don't know. What we do know is they're going to get something out. I think the argument that I've been hearing that I think is pretty reasonable is that they should not be doing it themselves. They should <laughs> let the private sector, they might wanna own the wallet or the on-ramp or off-ramp so you can have a government wallet or whatever it is that they need to get their taxes and get their KYC and AML, right? We're not gonna get round that. Um, can, should the private sector do it because it innovates faster? Most likely. Um, I don't know if that's the way it goes, but that, that would make sense to me. I think the innovation is going to come in behavioral economics that I've mentioned many times to people. I think um, having digital money allows behavioral incentive systems. We're used to them on the internet. You know, you do certain actions, you get a like button, you get, you know, all this behavioral stuff that's built in, we can do with money. So when you asked me the question before, what do we do about all of these people in retail that couldn't get a job? Well, you can give them a different set of outcomes to others. So, you know, let's say you, you do quantitative easing, you can actually give them direct capital from that. You can lower their tax brackets. You can do different things that's easier to do than it is, you know, you saw trying to get stimulus to certain people was a nightmare. 
uh, in the US, but you should be able to go to granular level. Those people in that town, you know, because they've had, um, they've had a hurricane and we can then stimulate them without having to do a postal kind of sending out of check, you know, the madness of all of this. We can stimulate different things, create different incentive systems. So I think the world is gonna change. I think, you know, one of the things of my exponential era basket of things that we talked about, I think behavioral economics is one of them. People won't like it either because what it is is controlling humans by in incentive systems but it's actually a better way of organizing government in some respects as well. So it comes with, as always, unintended consequences on the negative side and the positive side, you know. I never really thought about that way. In theory, you could print less or have a smaller stimulus package that was much better targeted and wasn't this sort of just sweeping, send out the helicopters and all of a sudden people who make 500 grand a year somehow get somehow getting stimulus credit cards in the mail, which was actually happening. Um, yeah, I actually heard reports talking about the shit show of the stimulus last time. They did the checks, then they did the direct deposit. And at some point, I don't know if you heard about this, but they moved to basically cash credit cards, like uh, prepaid debit cards. And people started receiving them in the mail, but they looked like generic junk mail, like all the you know fake credit cards you get. And people just started throwing them away and, and shredding them. And they were actually their stimulus. I mean, yeah, Crazy. I know people that but happened to Digital you know, has one of the things better. that's coming that people don't like, but it's pretty normal, is going to be digital identities, both private and public identities that are digital. So then if your career, your job is part of your digital identity, and let's say you're in the music industry and you've not been able to work for, for 14 months now, right? You can say, okay, music industry people, you pay you get this benefit and no taxes for the next three years. You know, that, that's actually a good way of running an economy. But what gets in the way is people go, digital identity, they're spying on us. I'm like, I don't know how to help. You can either have nobody spying on you and nobody looking after you, or you can have somebody looking after you and allowing yourself to be discovered. There is no halfway house. Well, to me, the joke of that is always, it's like the person who's yelling about uh, their privacy and identity as they're like searching Google on their iPhone. Yes. Right. And I mean, the reality is they know everything about you. They know where you are. You're giving them this uh, information voluntarily regardless. Google owns more information on more people on earth than any other single entity ever. And the US government knows that. This is not a separate organization. It is no different than Alibaba's connection with the Chinese China. state. There is no difference with what Amazon data has or Apple has or anybody else. The state, because they all pay their taxes to the state and they operate out of the country by the graciousness of the state, if they want the data, they'll have the data. So, um, yeah, so, you know, th there is no world that exists where you're not connected to the state. Or unless somehow you're completely off grid, but who wants to live like that? Uh, but that, you know, it kind of touches on the fact that your fear should be more of the corporations than it should be of the, the government. So actually a digital dollar or whatever, the, the, the privacy you're giving up there is a privacy you've already probably sacrificed 10 times over. Well, to... no, I mean, people say, yeah, but cash is private. When's the last time you used dollar bill, right? It's like to tip the bloke that parks your car. It's exactly like, it. And it's, it's a mess because you've never got any dollars. You've never got any cash. So we don't use cash. We're not a cash society. So there is no privacy because you use your credit card and you use your bank account. So everybody knows what's going on. So that's not a world that exists. I don't know anybody who lives in a cash-based society. Uh, you know, yeah. in the developed world, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Do you think that uh, the proliferation of a digital dollar and central bank digital currencies will help adoption of crypto? Because of course, the whole yeah. digital world is being built. And again, what I think is fascinating is to just walk away from the narratives. The very reason they're building digital currencies is because Bitcoin was invented. Mm -hmm. And they're not doing it to compete with Bitcoin. They've gone, I get it now. The world is going it works digital. better. <laughs> world's going digital. And I don't think really they have a problem that there is an asset that exists that is a digital asset that's not controlled by anybody. I mean, there are other assets that exist in the world, such as gold or real estate or whatever it is, artwork. That's okay. 
and they can be trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar markets, and that's okay. But they've seen that a digital world is the future. Bitcoin showed the way. Then Silicon Valley kind of built around everything digitally, and they've gone, I, I get it. And I think it's just on ramps and off ramps. It's just better for Bitcoin, better for this whole space. I think it's better for all of us. Um, and, you know, that's okay. You know, really, here's an interesting thing is I was chatting to some guys out of Singapore who are arbitragers and option market makers and traders in crypto. And I'm like, listen, what, you know, we're so US centric right now. I'm like, what's going on with these stable coins in Asia? Why is all this volume? Because the angry people shouting at the internet are saying, capital flight, money laundering, crooks, right? So I said, so what's going on? He goes, oh, it's pretty simple. He goes, like, there's Malaysian exporters dealing with China. Currently, there's capital restrictions on both. Doesn't mean they can't, but they have to file some certificate. They have to get approval. And then what happens is they have to cross the Malaysian ringgit RMB cross rate, which is not liquid and has big spreads. And then there's corresponding banks and middlemen in the middle. So it's a really expensive, slow process. So they just do stable coins, Malaysian ringgit, tether, super liquid, tether, RMB, super liquid. He says, and so they're passed. settling trade transactions in, in three minutes. He's like, that's what's going on. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, it's, just it's, it's just better. It's just better. Just better. It just functions for them. And that's why we see, it was like Vietnam sits capital flight. Of course, there's some capital flight, but Vietnamese companies who trade in the region have, have problems with capital restrictions. This just makes it easy to buy and sell goods. It's perfect. Yeah, I personally almost exclusively transact in stable coins. Really? Even from the United States. Yeah, I, that's how I pay. I mean, it's a nightmare for my accountant, but uh, that's, that's how I pay employees. That's how I do almost everything. And I used I to do it with Bitcoin. That. And I used I to do it with Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. Um, yeah. I, ha I haven't taken that plunge, I guess, because I've just piled everything. I, I literally have no money apart from stuff that's in Bitcoin and Ethereum right. and some of this other stuff. But a friend of mine just sold some of his Bitcoin, so just top slice, and you know, he's been in for a long time. And he said, I've just realized, Rowley, because I just kept it in stable coins and I'm getting 6% interest. That's, well, that's part of the and he's like, <laughs> And he's like, unless I'm buying a house or a car or I need it, he goes, I'm not sure that I need to use a bank account anymore. I think I even I haven't gone through that realization fully. Oh. I know many people have. I definitely have a bank account, but um, I certainly don't park cash in it anymore like I did when I was a kid. Now, like you said, I park, I primarily use Voyager. I've talked about it a lot of times. I'm getting 10% on USDC sitting there. I mean, I just keep it there until I need it. And then I go to my bank account and uh, spend that uh, dirty fiat, as they like to say, and you know, for the things I need, but I primarily transact in stable coins. Fascinating. Yeah, I think that that's the future. I know that we've uh, kind of run out of time here. I have one more question, which is, is there anything that can blow this all up for crypto? Is it regulation? Is there a threat? Is there some black swan event, <laughs> which is funny I've, to talk about a year after we've I've just said this some, black swan event. <laughs> I've explained something to people that there's a bunch of known knowns, right? These are the, or the known unknowns, which is regulation, mm -hmm. you know, the 51% attack, the quantum computing, blah, 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 blah. Quantum blah. computing, right? There again. The actual risk to me is something much more nuanced, which is central bank digital currencies come. I'm going to give you a scenario. Central bank digital currencies come. The IMF and the BIS have already said we need to lower the dollar's weight in the world. So we will maybe want to create a, a world currency basket, right? That we can all transact in much easier for all of us, which was basically the Facebook Libra idea, but done by the central right. banks. What happens if they did that? And the IMF have been talking about, we need a new Bretton Woods, some huge fiscal spending package. So let's say they allow everybody as part of this basket, these, these 10 or 20 nations, call it G20. You say, right, 30% of GDP go. Everybody does it. Stock market goes up, you know, Bitcoin goes up, gold goes up. But they've done, and then they say, okay, now to remain in this basket, you can only inflate your money supply by 2%. And if you cheat, you're out. 
So therefore, you then have stability of money or relative stability of money. It makes Bitcoin at the margin significantly less attractive. Of course. Now, there's philosophical reasons and the you know non-centralized reasons and all the other reasons why Bitcoin is still attractive, but it makes gold less attractive, Bitcoin less attractive. That you know, this is basically the exchange rate mechanism we had in Europe for a while that it didn't work. And I'm not saying it's going to work forever, but if they implemented that for 10 or 20 years, it's true. It yeah. would make Bitcoin less needed. Yeah, I mean, you're hedging against something that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, or there's really. a lower risk of right. it happening. Therefore, you need less Bitcoin. So right. that would be my risk is if central banks understood why Bitcoin was powerful and changed accordingly. Can they do it? I've no idea. You know, what probability would I give this? I've no idea. 10%. Yeah, but it, it's it's, it's inter interesting to think about, though. Well, thank you so much. I know we're, we're out of time here. Where can everybody follow you, check out what you're doing uh, after this conversation? Yeah, as e easy. I'm always on Twitter at Raoul, R-A-O-U-L, G-M-I. Uh, you know, I try my best to respond to as many people as possible. And also uh, check me out on Real Vision as well. So if you're interested in the crypto side, it's free. And it's, it's an unbelievable amount a of incredible content. It's amazing. I mean, it's a game changer. So realvisioncrypto.com, um, it's unbelievable. And then all of the Real Vision macro stuff is there as well. There's a free YouTube channel and then there's whole membership tiers. But realvisioncrypto.com, go there, sign up. It's free uh, and it's amazing. Well, next time we do this, I want to dig far deeper into that. It kind of uh, just, the time time went by really fast. But thank you again so much. And uh, hopefully we will do this again in the future. Scott, loved it. Really enjoyed it. Stop.